Hello, everybody. Welcome into another edition of Head Coach U. I am Brian Fisher, joined as always by former BYU and Virginia head coach Bronco Mendenhall. In this episode, another special one, we got Lance Leifold, the head coach of the Kansas Jayhawks. Lance, thanks for uh, taking some time out and uh, jumping on this episode with us. Well, thank you for asking. It's great to be with you. Absolutely. Well, we had uh, we had Mac Brown, one one of the active head coaches with, with a national title, on a couple episodes. Now, now you have six of them. Now, is it just in your office uh, about a month ago? Uh, you, you don't have the rings like displayed out. Did you ever bring those out uh, for, from all those national titles you had there at uh, Whitewater? You know, they're they're at home on a shelf. Uh, you know, really haven't uh, worn them a lot. There's a certain time that you know, and very proud that they and what we we're able to accomplish but at, you know again at the i was at the division three level and, and now being at the fbs level I, I i try to keep that in its own little category but um um you know and i think the other thing and coach may attest to this is as soon as you have a chance to obtain something like that your mind quickly change you know turns the page and you're worried about uh, getting on to the next one and trying to match it or surpass something. So we've always kind of tried to operate that way. Hmm. So as as you consider maybe the the whitewater experience and maybe the foundational elements, uh, do you see yourself coaching and leading uh, in a similar capacity? Just maybe the uh, the surroundings are different, or or how could you compare a contrast? Just and, and Buffalo in between, maybe you could just kind of give us a, a comparison between maybe who you've been at each place. And that might have been the same. Um, or if you found yourself having to learn and grow and adapt at each place and different strengths and, and challenges. Wow, that's a that, that's a pretty loaded one there, Coach. I, I think, uh, you know, maybe could kind of we'll, we'll hit them as we go here. But, yeah, I think, I've you know, we've all had to evolve, especially of late. You know, it's. Um, you know, the ways we, we interact and the things you have to, to work on maintaining and and be maybe at our best in communication and transparency with, with your current players. Um, we know that through technology, social media, things like that, uh, players are more aware and savvy and, and world knowledge, I guess, of, of what the landscape's like. And, and uh, um, before, I think we're a lot more in our, our, our bubble, so to speak. Um, you know, it'll be what, um, getting all my years about, you know, 16 years ago, 17 years ago, I became a head coach and, and, um, you know, is that my alma mater? It's where I grew up. Um, uh, but I hadn't been back to the state of Wisconsin in, in really 13 years, but, uh, it still had a, a little bit of feeling of, I grew up 15 miles from campus. Uh, the place was very dear to me, but, um, you know, I look at some of those things. I don't know how you felt coach, uh, when you became a head coach, you always want to get there. You want to do that. And then all of a sudden you, you become a head coach. And then all of a sudden you sit in the desk the first day and you go, what, where do I begin? And where's that head coaching for dummies book is what I used to say. And, and, and you learn on the fly. Um, I've been very fortunate uh, as a head coach that we've been able to retain a lot of staff at all the stops. Um, you know, as I referred to Whitewater, more regional recruiting at the Division Three level, probably within a th three-hour radius uh, at the most. Um, so that's a little different. Go to Buffalo, I'd never been out east and uh, really learning. And I think internally, not just moving up to the, the Mid-American Conference, FBS football, now dealing with scholarships. Uh, the nice thing was I was a Division Two coach for 10 years and you're dividing scholarships and you're doing things like that as an assistant, the head coach handled that. Now, making that move to Buffalo, uh, I think the other thing besides locality and FBS level was really an increased staff and, and making sure that your staff is on the same page and, and aligned in what you're doing and communicating things throughout uh, that became, and I, it kind of hit me again when I, you know, and really it's it's kind of unique, guys, that we're meeting today because uh, um, it was really two years ago yesterday that I got on a plane and came to Lawrence, Kansas. And it was a very odd time. They were finishing spring ball. But again, then the first time I met with the staff, it was probably double the amount of people in the room than there was even at Buffalo. So um, it keeps evolving. Staffs are bigger and making sure that culturally, um, not just with communication, but alignment and philosophies, I think have become very important. Man, I, I love the I love the idea, just as you brought up kind of scope and scale of staff members. And I'm, I'm sure Whitewater was X amount of staff members and Buffalo was X amount of staff members. Uh, and now 
Yeah, <laughs> here comes another number. Um, and I know you just came out of a staff meeting and I know how important alignment is and culture. And so in, in your in your rhythm, I know there's different rhythms at different times of the year. How frequently are with, are you with your staff? How important do you think that is? And I'm talking collectively, maybe as an all staff, all hands on deck. How often do you do that and how important do you think it is um, or do you? Well, uh, great question. And probably not enough, maybe in some people's eyes, too many, too much in other <laughs> people's eyes. You know, um, as we also know, like even things like podcasts and, and, and Zoom calls and things like that, I think we've really changed uh, many ways how we operate after, after COVID and the pandemic. Um, and in some ways can be very efficient. Uh, we, don't, we all don't have to be in the same place to, to execute and we can work uh, hopefully more efficiently. Um, I'd mentioned earlier um, a little bit about our staff, I guess, and make sure I get back to answering this, but um, our defensive coordinator, Brian Borland, not, has been together with me ever since I became a head coach, uh -huh. okay? Our defense, uh, excuse me, our offense co coordinator, Andy Kolnicki, is now going on year 11 with me. Uh, Rob Ionella, who was on the field with us, uh, is now our general manager. We worked together way back 30 years ago at the University of Wisconsin, and we've worked together now um, nine straight years. So we we have a lot of uh, continuity, which uh, allows us to to you know operate maybe sometimes without as many staff meetings. There's trust. There's other ways that we we've, we've had that dialogue um, to go through. Um, we've kind of broken some things up. You know, you know, I don't even know the exact color groups and who's in them, coach, <laughs> but we'll sometimes call a meeting and certain people need to be in the room. The other people zoom in and then it might be more if it's a recruiting weekend. Obviously, the recruiting staff's going to be in the in the building. The personnel group are in there. Maybe the analysts are not as in there for some of those and they zoom in and keep working. If it's during the season, of course, the analysts and coaching uh, people that are involved in game planning and whatnot are going to be in the room. And, and many of the recruiting staff will be zooming in and, uh, you know, from their offices. So we've tried to break it up that way and allow people to kind of still be productive within their within their time. And I, I listened to you talk about um, your staff members who had been with you so long. And, and that was the approach that, that I believe in and, and took as well. Most of my staff members were groomed from within. Um, I'd look at the end of every year and see which players – I thought would be the greatest leaders uh, and uh, I would approach them about being a graduate assistant, but only if I thought they could end up surpassing or maybe sitting around the full time staff table. That was the criteria. Mm -hmm. And then if they got that chance, then they became a position coach and eventually a coordinator. But that continuity I found really, I think, to your point, efficient um, with fewer meetings uh, and more speed. And as you said, two, two years ago, um, in a really unique time frame, you're arriving in Lawrence, Can Kansas. And regardless of where you end up, uh, expectations, uh, there are expectations and, <laughs> and wins matter and, and how fast you can show progress. And, and I think having staff members that you worked with and re can rely on, I think that expedites the process, but more importantly, the trust that's already established. Man, that's, uh, that's really helpful as you, take on a new environment. What, what did you, um, what did you uncover maybe when you arrived at Kansas from what you thought it would be? I know for me arriving at Virginia, I thought it was one thing. And then it took an entire year of discovery to really determine what it was. I'm interested, uh, how close to what you thought the University of Kansas was and the state of affairs prior to you coming. And then now you've been there two years. Um, what, what were the reference points and, and how far off was maybe what you thought and what was reality? Well, that's a good question. I, if we could, I'd, I'd like to come back to some of the staffing things of sure. alignment later as well. I, I think that are really uh, helpful, at least in, in my world. Yeah, um, you know, this was, you know, many, many had thought the toughest, maybe most difficult power five job and because of its lack of success in 12 years, I had went back to Wisconsin to their uh, uh, state clinic about a month ago. And I had somebody like pull up some old stuff for our communication staff of what it was really like prior, you know, during that 12 year drought really since coach Mangino. And, and I looked at some of those numbers. I went, I'm glad I really didn't research this thing too far. <laughs> you know, I, um, but, um, 
But what I did find out, Coach, is a couple of things. One, externally, there's been a lot of loyal, patient fans that are just starving for some consistency and and progress. And uh, yes, Kansas is known, and, and rightfully so, for being a basketball school and its great tradition. But there are some people that want to see this program. And a lot of them, we're able to see that when, when we got off to a good start where we started to fill the stadium again, that are really, uh, you know, Football fans, college football fans, um, you know, in this area now with the Chiefs winning the Super Bowl again, there's people that are passionate. Kansas State's done a great job. There's some people there that want to see us do well. The other one is is probably much like yourself um, when you got to Virginia. You know, I sat down with every player. Now, this was finals week. I was trying. Guys are getting out the door, and you're trying to hang on and learn so much, and it's kind of a whirlwind, as you know. But players – Today, as much as everything's changed, when I ask them, what does this program need most? And I started writing down what every kid said. And, and you know, it came from leadership. I said, from who? He goes, well, we need more leadership from coaches. We need more leadership from players. But the other ones that were really stuck out, because those are those are general, and, and it to me was they wanted more structure. They wanted more accountability, and they wanted more discipline. And sometimes we don't think young men, we just, you know, they'll, they'll test you. We know that they, they're going to, but at the same time, they were begging. And again, that's not against the former staff or anything else, because as we know, through the pandemic, we were trying to do everything we could to get to kickoff. And a lot of other little things, I think sometimes because we were operating in silos and other things were happening, kind of got, you know, pushed aside and we lost some of that focus on those little things. And uh, so when they said that, I said, OK, we've got a good chance here. We, we do. We now. It, but that was probably the most that. And then we we made the switch to morning practices. And I don't know what you were doing there at, at either stop there in, in this. But once we have, you know, you kind of worry about it. You know, they, they kind of look at you funny. But at the end of the day, they found out that their personal lives were better at the they had more time at the end of the day. You know, there's so many other positives to that. That really helped us in the trust factor that we were working in a direction, not only to try to be a better football team, that we're also we're looking out for them. Yeah, R really powerful. There, There's uh, two great books that just kind of their research substantiates what you said regarding morning practice. One is called Spark, um, like a flame spark. And what they found, uh, they okay. took <laughs> they, they took they found a school, um, a, a high school, and they did this pilot program with remedial students. And what they found was that if they gave them a fierce bout of exercise right before their most challenging subject, they track that and they found that within X amount of time period, none of those kids were in remedial subjects anymore. They had been mainstreamed. Wow. And then they then they in, um, in, incorporated it into the student body at large. And so they were using exercise prior to um, a difficult subject matter. And, and that school, if I remember correctly, and I encourage our readers to, to go back and, and listeners to go back and look at this, but I believe they ended up leading the world in math and science um, after that change. And so uh, we went to morning practices as well and, and had been for a number of reasons. I, I liked the, the, the thought of priority on how important that was, but also the, the real world starts early. And, and so I, I liked the training that that was going to give these kids and that we were their first, we were their best and first chance to start a great day um, with messages of substance and unity and, and things that were going to be uplifting. But also there was a physio physiological benefit to learning. And Virginia is a very challenging school. Brigham Young is a challenging school. And so it fit really well at BYU, back to your point with personal lives, so many players there were married. And mm -hmm. They have children at home and it's 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 pseudo professional ish because of the age. And and so anyway, the research on on exercise is really important. The other part back to expectations. When you ask the players, there's a, a, a group that's called Teach for America and they take these young college kids and they when they graduate, they go out in these really rough areas where no one really wants to teach. And they they do a pretty remarkable job. But what they found was the greatest gift we as leaders can give or teachers can give is that of high expectations and that that was the biggest determinant on outcome was the expectations of the teacher now 
um, that doesn't mean, and that was within the classroom period, but before and after there was this outpouring of love and care and empathy, but within the hours of class, there was really no quarter given. There was the expectations were going to hold, but those mm -hmm. teachers and coaches before and after were absolutely empathetic and sympathetic and doing everything they could to help those. So there's this unique combination of um, performance expectations, but also love. And when those two things came together, that's kind of the sweet spot. And it sounds like you experienced some of that. We did. And, uh, you know, probably much like yourself and others out there, you know, we, we, we have a lot of expectations and um, on our guys each and every day from, from body weights to having hydration tests before they go out and practice. So we don't cramp, um, you know, supplements to, you know, eating breakfast and all, all the, all these other little things of, of doing things in a point system and culture teams and all these things. And after that first year, and, you know, we were two and 10 after arriving in May and, but played better down the stretch. We were fortunate to upset Texas. And then we played, you know, some close games and lost in the fourth against uh, TCU and West Virginia. At the end of the season, I asked Kenny Logan, our all-conference safety, I said, Kenny, what do you like best that we do as a staff, maybe compared to the past? He goes, well, you know, I really like the structure. I like all the check-ins. I like what we do and, and, and how you keep us going like that. And I said, okay, what do you like least about what we do as a staff, maybe compared? He said, uh, the the, the check-ins, the structures, and all the things you make us do. And, and, and again, you know, and, I, and just like you, that's what I did. I laughed, and, and I find it because – I think that's really says a lot about, uh, you know, young men today. They may not like it, but they know it's better. And that and that's when you can do those things. And and they see that you do care and you think there's product production in different ways. I just know as a head coach, I used to struggle early on because, you know, you got a one o'clock or a one thirty, uh, you know, team meeting, before, you know, in the afternoon or between 12:30 and 1:29 somebody walks in and drops something on you that happened that kind of just puts you in a different mindset than you want to be when you walk in front of the team and and by going in the morning it doesn't mean things happen in these young men's lives during the day or during the evening sometimes but we're able to have a better grasp on it like you say start with that positivity and things they love doing and and Usually they had to get up and lift anyway, and they've really responded. I was resistant at Buffalo doing it. We didn't have an indoor right away. We had to drive 30 minutes to get to the Buffalo Bills when we had to go inside. So that was a lot of other logistical nightmares. So once we got there, I was like, I don't know about this. I, you know, I was kind of old school in that way, but I'll, I'll never go back. In fact, you talk about cultural changes, Coach. I kind of give you another one was – you know, we said I arrived in May. Everybody's registered for fall classes. And I talked to our people that handle it. I said, I want to move to morning practices. Well, I don't know, coach. You know, we can we can get that done for second semester. Now I'd like you to try now. And then well, you come back away. Well, yeah, we got some conflicts. And I'd say, give me, give me the list. I and then I said, I don't want to go on the field at 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., but we're gonna find a way to do this. All that, you know, I got about three no's to five conflicts that got down to one. And, uh, again, I think when you go into, you know, changing a program, you don't just change the culture in the building. Sometimes you got to change the culture of the other facets that touch your program within an athletic department as well. That That's such a powerful point. And I found that the efficiency and the effectiveness of the organization um, – was certainly tied um, to the branches uh, outside of the building um, or sometimes in the building, but on a different floor. And, and so much like you just mentioned, and that window for change, I can't say that there isn't change your second year or your third year or your fourth or your fifth, but there's an opportunity at the beginning. If you can assess what really needs to happen and be accurate wow, is that window powerful to start? And and as you mentioned, as you held to your guns and were unrelenting on the standard, uh, that sets a precedent for every uh, subgroup within uh, the Jayhawk family to take notice of, um, yeah, no is not really an option. How to accomplish is really what we're expected to do. And that's 
to me, those kind of stories end up driving the culture maybe faster and more effectively because, as you know, if any one of the, let's say the athletic trainers are not aligned expectation wise, uh, let's say the academic staff is not aligned, um, strength staff, um, that, that would be really tough. Um, maybe fundraising, a any of the parts that are so imperative, what if they're not aligned and what if their time frames and urgency doesn't match your time frames and urgency. Um, and to say that that doesn't impact, there's just frustration that builds and it really gets in the way of and puts a ceiling and imposed ceiling on your progress. And so um, I'm interested, how many of the support staff uh, did you inherit? Um, how many br did you bring? Because a lot of times folks talk about coaching staff, but right. this is a whole other area that I think, wow, was it important? And so from strength coaches to academic staff to trainers, et cetera, how, how, did you inherit those folks or, or were they, did they come with you? Um, academics, we inherited. Um, training staff, we inherited. Um, strength staff, we brought. Now, on that line, talk about building, and, and I kind of look back in our time at Buffalo and I kind of go, wow, in my six years there, we had five strength coaches. So, you know, again, yeah, and it was hard for various reasons, but obviously we hit it really well on this last one and he's he's with us now. And and like you said, I, I'd say the things that I'm very fortunate about here at Kansas is got an outstanding training staff and they are completely aligned with, with, with the strength staff. And, and I think that's what you know. When you don't have that, when it comes to soft tissue and other things, it really is difficult in programs. Um, our academic staff, um, again, I, it's been very good. I've been very pleased there. Um, and, and just to kind of go back off of what we said in structure and, and but follow through, but also through this is last semester, we had a, a program best GPA in the history of Kansas football. We had, they had 10 academic All-Americans before our arrival. We had three last year. Our missed appointments went from the, the fall before we got here 400 and some when you got 100 play that's like four per kid down to like 120 and when they saw that we were following up when things when they weren't supposed to be that built the relationship with the academic people real quickly it could, you you can attest to this one was we had that hold list you know for registration parking tickets and all that you're smiling <laughs> you're having a flashback coach i know yeah. <laughs> we had 80, we had like we had like 60 guys on it and well i'm on the coaches to get it changed well anyway registration priority registration goes through we get the list back and we got 19 guys that haven't registered and i'm 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 pretty hot you know and and they said yeah but coach uh, a year ago we had 65 and i was like something it was like you know they were happy with that number again expectations of where it was at but but when you're aligned and working well together um because of the timing, I guess to keep answering your questions, uh, um, you know, I, I, I made a small adjustment. Operations went to player development because that position was open. That was temporary for one year, and that and that that lady moved on back into operations. I kept the analysts and GAs because of the transitional time, and then that uh, most of that turned over the next year. I. Uh, I brought some guys in the off-field roles that were on field at, at Buffalo to try to mix it. It was, it was I, I tried to blend it together the first year as best we could, five on the field, five off from, from each staff. But like I used the word alignment before, Coach, as much as you try to do that, um, it doesn't mean people are, are, as you know, there's a lot of good football coaches out there. There's a lot of ways to win football games. But um, um, after, the, after the first season, we were able to get much more aligned in what we're doing. And I think our, our players saw it. And, and again, you're able to move in, in a different direction sooner. So um, we, we pretty much have it. I'd say now we're probably 75 um, has been like brought in in some capacity. I guess I was going to say it to you before of, you know, some of our continuity. Um, I mentioned most of those guys that, that, I've been the coordinator's been with me uh, quite a while. Our offensive line coach, our our receivers coach, uh, and a and a few others I had worked with at Nebraska Omaha back in my Division two days, and as we were growing up together, 
Our quarterback coach was my first coordinator at Wisconsin Whitewater. And then when he went to work for Jerry Kill and then he came back. So I, the thing I it, it kind of probably what you're alluding to also is that not just football knowledge. We have a lot of ways to learn the game, but it's character. It's in, integrity. It's how they're going to talk to the players, how they're going to go out and recruit and talk to coaches. And, and, and the best feeling in the world is when you meet with a family to wrap up the recruiting visit and they talk about a the staff is thorough they're honest they're genuine and and things have been answered and and it gives you such a good feeling because i know these people not just as football coaches but as husbands and fathers and as well i, I uh and that part i know exactly what you're talking about and it, it because the reality is um, everything that happens in the program you're responsible for even though there's owners of processes, there's one owner of all the owners <laughs> of the processes, and that's you. And when those people, um, you know them and you trust them and they're aligned, and I'm not just talking about professional uh, competencies, I'm talking about personal competencies. Yeah. And when, when you don't ever worry and when you're uh, so uh, excited that that coach gets to meet with that family because you know what a powerful person and and the quality of person they are and you can't wait for them to meet. It, it's fun to have those kind of people around you. Uh, I used to have a pretty simple rule that I wouldn't work with anyone I didn't like. And but but like like was defined by fiercely capable at their job, but amazingly compassionate as a human being. Yeah. And and when you put those two things together, um, the amount of worries that you have in your seat just they diminish it doesn't because there's always going to be problems with, right. with that many people making choices and and so when you mitigate that which it sounds like you've done uh the one area i, I forgot to ask you about i think is super relevant today when it comes to personnel uh, personnel director or whatever you call in, in your program um man how big a role is that for you now um with player personnel and recruiting and then and what have you done or what are your thoughts regarding um monitoring the portal and does is there a whole separate entity that does that or considering other programs and there's the landscape is changing and so how are you navigating all of that well um rob ianello who i'd mentioned is our general manager so he oversees a lot i don't know if you've ever met rob or not but he, he um, i have very yeah, you, know, rob, you know rob is one of the most organized guys he can handle a lot on his plate he was at university of wisconsin for coach alvarez Two times uh, was at Notre Dame, Arizona was a head coach, and he and he he's a good balance for me in many many ways. Grant Murray's our director of player personnel, played for us at Whitewater, came to Buffalo as a volunteer, mm -hmm. and does an outstanding job. Um, we have three others that are in the in in the uh, recruiting personnel department, and uh, as you know, when it's these portal windows, it's it's uh, it's mass chaos now and usually coaches are on the road when it's going on. So we've kind of got a little system worked out. It's, I don't know if it's the most, uh, if it's the best one out there, but it works for us about getting eyes on things and kicking it out. And then um, as we continue to do our research, but uh, Grant's one of the first ones that, that gets, gets eyes on it. Now our analysts that are inside also, we, we, we get deeper evaluations that way, depending on where the coach is, um, for the day and, and, and particular needs, then, then we jump in it that way. But it's uh, um, it, it's very unique. Uh, and, you know, everybody's trying to find their way of doing it. I think we're we're somewhere in the norm of how we go about it. And uh, but uh, yes, it's uh, it's a you know you, you take a recruiting department and an analyst and and quality control area. And you talk about the earlier as we started with those staff meetings. Um, <laughs> You know, I walk into I walk into one side of the ball meeting, like a defensive staff meeting. That's twice as many as uh, I had at Whitewater. I quickly, I, I, I when I was head coach at Whitewater in my first year, to you know fall camp seemed like normal. You know, we had you know you have your ad hoc coaches that kind of come in and help you out, and we we were pretty we we're above the norm probably in that area. But it was the very first day of school in Division Three. Our coordinator, everybody had other duties. And uh, some they, they had to teach three lecture classes, not activity courses. And and I'd gotten into work early, and I was sitting in my office for a while. And then it was about 
it was about 7.45 and I walked down the hallway and I looked, I was the only person in the building. And I, I did, I'm like, I'm like <laughs> what, what did I get into? So yeah, it's a, it, it's amazing how, how it's certainly changed mm. over the years. I, I bet that was so formative for you as a head coach and, and the appreciation, but also the challenge of managing more staff members, right? There, there's, there's a huge benefit, but there's also some challenges um, of alignment with more voices and, and keeping them aligned culturally. Um, and I'm sure you've experienced that. Yeah, it, you're extremely right. Because much like you say, you, you want people that are, you know, goal driven and have aspirations and, and, and do things that, uh, and we all have opinions, you know, and we, we know those and, and you want people to um, I don't want a bunch of yes men. You want people to, you know, st stimulate thought and, and a lot of times uh, counterbalance and, and make some things happen. But also with that, it has to be within the framework of alignment. And we've seen it for 30, 40 years where the old coach's handbook about what's decided behind, you know, we walk out of this room, it, it needs to stay that way. I, I'm pretty old school and yet in ways where I, a lot of times will still use coach a, a spiral notebook. Yeah. And, I, and I, I usually use it this way with our guys and say, uh, you know, um, I've got this notebook here. I, if you want to get one, go ahead. And uh, the front of the notebook is what we're doing. OK, when you leave the meeting, you can write in the in the back of the book when you become a head coach, what you would have done. Yeah. And when you become a head coach, you can decide which side of the notebook you start from. And uh, and and again, uh, go from there. I was an assistant coach for 10 years for a man named Pat Burns at Nebraska, Omaha. And uh, and I, I remember one time he, he, he'd come by and give me a, a, a post-it note and tell me to call this guy and follow up. And um, and then he'd walk out and I think to myself, man, by the time you walked in my office, you could have called him yourself. I became a head coach and what I found out was he had nine other people to call already. And I called him multiple times during my time at Whitewater and, and I told him and I thanked him. I said, there's not a week that goes by that I don't think to myself, now I know why he did what he did. And it's and it's definitely eye opening. And, and you want to try to have a staff that understands that as well, but also um, keep keep in mind that it's decisions are made for the best of the program. Yeah. And, and what a powerful story that, that you were groomed and mentored. Um, but, but maybe more importantly, that then you express gratitude once you truly understood and you need staff members. We all do that are willing to do what they're asked to do, even before they completely understand just because they trust the leader that there's a reason for this, even though I don't know for sure. Um, I know the leader well enough. And I trust him well enough that I'm going to do that. And eventually I'm going to figure this out. And, and sometimes you don't figure it out until you're in a similar seat as what they're in is what, what you're talking about. Right. And uh, I've had talks with guys as well. I don't know if you've ever had this as well, coach, is that you, you have some really good position coaches who aren't even coordinators yet, but sometimes they have a lot of really good opinions. But, and I said, you got to be at least the guy next to the guy, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, you know, sometimes when you're two chairs down, it, it, that's like armchair quarterback times two, because you don't have to call the defense and you don't have to do this. Sometimes you got to, and, and they don't have to look at the holistic totality of what decisions are made. And sometimes you got to really encourage them, A, to take a step back, B, maybe to take on some other responsibilities, or maybe it's time to go aspire to take one of those so you really understand what it's like. I, I see that as well. And I think you, you've probably experienced this also. There, there's a friction point that comes in that space. And you can sense that this assistant, even though you love him and trust him, there's a growth opportunity um, because he's so capable and confident in giving advice. That's not the same as making decisions. Uh, and, and those <laughs> two things are completely different. And a confident advice giver, um, there comes a point prior to them being the decision maker where that can go a number of ways. And and that will either happen within your program, or as you said, sometimes that's the time for them to grow and learn by taking another position where they can see that. And most often they come back thankful and grateful to see and learn and, and they could see where they were and where they needed to be to, to contribute at a higher level. I, I agree fully. Um, 
when I became the head coach at Whitewater, I hired, I mentioned it before, Jim Zabrowski as a, as my offensive coordinator and, and a, a quarterback coach. He had been, he, he get, he gave up a division three head coaching job at a smaller division three school. And I wanted somebody that had coached at division three, been a head coach. I talked to a couple guys because I, I, I comfortably say now, coach, I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room and I'm okay with it. But I also know that I have the responsibility to make the decision that has to ultimately we go with. And, but when you have enough people around you that want to do that, that helps. I used to put it in a, uh, our little coach's note when we used to give more of a that coach's handbook is that um, I'm open to all your suggestions, but I also want to know the solution yes. of how we're going to do it. Everybody can tell you how sometimes it's things that cost money and you just don't have it. So tell me, I'll, I'll listen to all those, all the suggestions you have, but also give, help me get to tell us how we're going to get there. I, I really, really like that. And I, I ended up and, and so many uh, head coaches that I talk to, I, I learn from just like I am today. Um, and then there's just such commonality. More often than not, we're more similar than different, even though when you're in it, um, you, you'd like to think your program is so unique and so different and so distinct. And, and, and many are in a lot of ways. But then there's this whole other area where they're so similar and there's differentiators, but there's this core thing that's so similar. And um I used to ask for the same thing, anyone that came to my office. And what I found as the head coach, and I'm not sure if it's the same for you, what I found is anyone that came to my office, they usually were going to present information from their point of view only. They had a time frame that was going to suit them uh, perfectly. Um, and they wanted an answer that was, quite frankly, in their best interest. Uh, in a time frame before. And so in contrast, they were asking me to make a decision before I had all the information. That's both sides or all sides in a time frame that was going to be that was going to allow that to happen and that might not go their way. And that's the head coach. Most that came in, uh, I just kind of matter of factly took that I'm going to get part of the information. I'm going to get a time frame that they want that's faster than what's going to be profitable for anyone. And uh, they're not really interested in uh, an answer that's not going to suit them. And so back to the solution idea, uh, the head coach's office is a great place for people to talk about what problems exist and what challenges. Uh, I have the same philosophy. I, I want to know wh whoever brought information to me, what are we going to do about it in a really comprehensive way? Not what just are you going to do? How is it going to benefit? And I didn't want blind spots or unintended consequences. And, and so what that started to do is that didn't mean problems didn't arrive in my office, uh, but it did mean that whoever came in had thought about it much more deeply. There were solutions that were expected, even though I didn't agree with them all. And it was more comprehensive. And that then led to a dialogue that we could address the problem in a way that was going to be more beneficial for everyone. And, and yeah, so uh, my personal assistant, the the gatekeeper, <laughs> you didn't make it through the gate without qualifying for those criteria. And because your time, as you know, is, you got a lot going. And so right. it, it resonates what you said. And to have someone else that was a head coach on your staff, what what a great asset just to be able to have a sounding board at times. Right. I, in fact, and then the latter part at Whitewater, I hired two former head coaches in the conference and they were, they had retired and all they wanted to do is go back and coach ball, you know, and, and go back to where they started and they became position coaches and they would move to whitewater and live seasonally in an apartment that we'd get them. And, and it was so refreshing because, you know, at those levels, whether it be fundraising or doing and roster manage all that, that's all you wanted was some other people. And you know what? They didn't come in and, and say much because they and, and they also at that stage of their careers really help mentor before it even gets into the room because they're trying to tell somebody what's really going on in the bigger picture sometimes before. So I found that to be uh, you know very beneficial. You know, uh, the, the next thing I was just as you were talking, there was just uh, a thought came into my mind. And, and I, I didn't even thought about this before you came on the podcast. But my first year at Virginia, two and ten. I'd never had a, a season like that before in my in my life. And then the next year, year two, um, 
the fans rushed, rushed the field when we beat Georgia Tech to become bowl eligible. And I'd never had fans rush the field to, to have a bowl eligible team. <laughs> and, and so we, we lost our bowl game. And so I, we were six and seven my second year. And then the next year was eight wins. The next year was nine years in the Coastal Championship and the Orange Bowl. And, and I was just thinking about your journey there. And in the first two seasons, as I'm listening to you talk, I, I can't say that I've been in your shoes exactly. Uh, but at a school that might be similar, maybe more known for basketball and having some challenges and a similar first couple of years, um, it's, it's invigorating to see the growth, I'm sure. And what's, how, how, can you uh, how would you define or describe what the attitude and the confidence level maybe is around your staff and your players at this point now after two years? Yeah, that's a great point. It's, it's, it, you know, we, we go so fast and, and we're always in a hurry, as you know, and then we, we transition on to the next thing, but it's still watching young men grow up and mature. And, and, and one of those, and, and we were talking about some of these other things earlier and gaining confidence and sometimes confidence and, you know, take away the record. I, I was talking about our academics. I've seen guys, I'm sure you have as well, a young man who came from maybe a, wasn't the greatest student or wasn't very academically confident. And he, all of a sudden he has academic success and it carries over to the field. His whole life changes. It, we, well, we have some of that going on, but now we've stacked on some of these wins on the field that it, it's really been neat to watch. And, and I say confidence, trust, development, all happening at the same time, because, you know, we, we had a young man just signed, um, he didn't get drafted, signed with Dallas, left tackle. He had eight position coaches wow. in his career here, wow. eight. He played tackle, tight end. So part of that was bounce back, but also the instability and, and, and well, why should I listen to you? My last coach was telling me to do it this way and, and all those things. So besides continuity, and I'll kind of slide in another one for you, is next year will be the first time in 20 years that the University of Kansas will have the same set of assistant coaches two years in a row. So again, you know, those things, so when our players see it and, and, and the weight room starts coming and yeah, we, we lost the three overtime bowl game, but we were down 20, what, four, five at half and battled back and tied it up. A year before that, if we were down 17 or more at halftime, it was the, the locker room was it was it was a morgue. It was and then you could see the games that they were hoping and still getting there. I said, you know, as you know, you got to stop hoping, you got to make it happen. But the games that were, you know, seven or less or up at half, boy, the energy and everything was there. They're just hoping to get there and, and keep going. Now we're at a different point, and, and that's that confidence in, of, you know, you, you're winning some, you're still maybe coming short against some of them. Now you got to take that next step. And we have, I think, 17 returning starters. Um, we've got a fine young quarterback in Jalen Daniels who was injured last year, came back uh, late in the year. But, uh, you know, we've got a nucleus of guys that, that believe now. They believe not only in, in what the staff and what the – what the process is, they, they believe in themselves and where we're going in a, in a very competitive conference, but we're excited for this next step and, and to see them kind of take that, um, you know, we work a lot on some of our culture talks. We work on leadership and things that you're saying, our strength coach does a lot with them on them. Matt Gildersleeve does an outstanding job. And as you know, when you can get this, you know, get your program to be a player led program, that's when that that's when that next big jump can happen. Just fascinating, and and so much of the journey, as you already said, the player development is is the most captivating part to me. Seeing young people grow, I I love that part, and seeing them go from number one, even having hope, uh, because there are programs and there are people that don't have hope currently, and so to to number one, see them have hope is a great step to see them move toward belief is well that's just so much more fun and then to see them confidently expect outcomes that they're just that there's there's a a a presence that they carry themselves with which is it's just fascinating and fun to see and consistency and leadership i think facilitate that which is the coolest thing i think about the job that you have is is being able to 
to see that. And you mentioned academics. I wanted to share one one pr uh, thing we did at, uh, at Brigham Young University that just might help our listeners as well. To your point, we were having academic dinners for for players that were reaching a 3.0, and and I was learning as a head coach and and. That, that was eliminating so many of our team members who really needed the most support in learning and growing academically. And so we ended up changing the criteria where if, if all you did was get 0.0001% better on your GPA than the semester before, you were improving and that qualified you for um, this, this event. And so we were celebrating the simple successes like crazy. And it was amazing just to see once someone thought they had a chance to win, what that did to who they were, and and I think that's what's what's happening in your program from as I'm watching from afar. That that's a great point, and and you're right. Um, you know we've you know we started doing you know we meet. I'm sure you did all the same. We we meet academic with our academic advisors every week. They they come over and sit with us. Offense goes in one room, defense in the other myself and, and the strength coach or general manager, we, we alternate rooms so we can hear and get the updates on a weekly basis. But much like we give players of the week during the season, we give, you know, a, a lifter of the week or the guy of the week, we call it, who's done a great job. Um, we give a rack of the week in the weight room. Well, we started, we have academic guys of the week, one on each side of the ball. And, and we and then we do it in nutrition. We do it, who's ever rewarding the efforts that are in the off season that no one else has really seen. But when we, when it's up in a team meeting and then it ends up on social media, like you said, what it can do for that young man and, and, and those around him is, is really been neat. It's fantastic. And, and just when young people know what they can, so what they can control when they're recognized for that, when they do control it and, and commit to it at a high level, because we already know and we're preaching to them, right? Nutrition is important. But what if they're not rewarded or recognized for it? Right. Strength is important. But what if they're not recognized or rewarded for it? And, and when you masterfully craft it, how you've done, where every area that you're saying is important is then rewarded as important, you know, that closes the loop. And it, it, it basically tells the players that you mean what you say and there's trust. Right. And I, I think that's one that I'm sure you'd agree is that what, what we – what I think has been one of the biggest things that has allowed us to take as big a jump as we did last year is the sense of accountability and expectation is in every facet of their life while they're here. They have an academic expectation. They have a nutritional expectation. They have a weight room expectation. They have a preparation, might even be training room, prehab or rehab, whatever that is, because we, we they know that everything they're doing is, is somewhat being analyzed and, and, and I don't want to say corrected, but coached up and, and monitored, I guess. It allows them, like you said, I think you said it to, so well, it closes the loop. And because mm -hmm. and, and, you can't tell someone it's okay to be five minutes late for class, but, but they expect them to be five minutes early for meetings. You know, it's, it's, it, it's such a mixed message that I think our players then have been able to grasp this and, uh, and, and, take, it, and take it to heart. It's, it's really cool. And uh, one of the things that, that I believe uh, is that I used to share, which to, is to your point that and, and is how that you do one thing is how you do everything. I, I think and we all want to compartmentalize different levels of importance. And we'll do this at this level. and We'll do this at this level because it's not quite as important in this one. Sometimes the things you like least done at the highest level is where the most growth happens. And, and so for a coach like you that is running a program that's stressing accountability in all those areas, the most comprehensive growth is going to happen with your team and those individuals. And that's what's happening. And man, then you really hope, and it almost always happens, then you really hope the results on the field, right, support that methodology in a, in a timely enough way to keep momentum. Um, and then that, then that becomes really fun. It, it sure does. You're right. Because, you know, sometimes when it doesn't, you're, you're man, you're, you're working these kids. You want them to believe in it and, and darn it, they're doing it. And it's just not, you know, it's not showing up. And then, then all of a sudden that wavering can happen. But, you know, we start off again, we're, as we're sharing stuff, we inherited a team that um, in 2020 was the most penalized team in the Big 12. 
in our first season, even though we won two games, we were the fourth least penalized team in the NCAA. Yeah. And, and so again, we've taken those things, not just for, you know, this isn't a pat on the back. This is for them to understand that the little details matter. And this is where it shows because you can't, you know, as, as you know, when you're, when you're suffering through those two and tens, moral victories aren't, isn't doing it. It's not doing it internally and it's not going to happen externally with your fan base. And, and I think what we've also talked a lot about on is it's unfortunate so much. We're in such a hurry to, to get to success in the, in the, in the win column that these other victories of really where this was set up to be has sometimes been, been really pushed in the way back of some, some things. Well, and, and really to, to your point, one of, one of the biggest challenges I think for any head coach, but also college athletics right now is um, where, where is the true intent for player development? Uh, because as coaches come in, you have basically two and a half years to show significant improvement. <laughs> And, and that's a fast time frame. And now there's a chance to, to basically reload your roster um, from other places, right? Uh, and, and so the, uh, the developmental approach and the teaching approach and the comprehensive um, caring approach that you're taking, uh, it, um, it resonates to me. And I think there's huge value in that. And those are the programs that I would love to see have success. Um, and and so that counterbalance to the the urgency because when has developed happen when has development ever happened fast right. <laughs> it, it just and so there's a there's a really head coaches uh, are in a really tough spot right now with the expectations and then this idea of bringing along a team and a roster and changing an entire culture and tradition that's been lacking and you're doing it and um I just uh, I'm thrilled to see that happen and just so grateful that you spent time sharing with us today what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I'm sure our listeners just really benefited. So, Lance, just thank you for being with us today. Well, I appreciate it very much, Coach. It's, a, it's great to be with you, Brian. Good to see you as well. And I hope I hope just like any coaches clinic, right, if, if, if a coach can pick one or two things from this that that can help them along the way, whether it be immediately with their team or somewhere down the line. I hope they found some some good in it and would love to do it again with you sometime soon. Be really fun. Brian, we'll turn it over to you to close this out. Yeah, it definitely kind of felt like a, a conversation that you would hear at, at a coach's clinic, and we appreciate the time so much, Lance. Don't don't think that I didn't hear that uh, Bronco, he, he doesn't do this often. He kind of set a bar for you there about eight uh, having eight wins in year three, uh, kind of like <laughs> Virginia. So just just letting you know that that okay. next time you come on, you know, you, you yeah. got to – For the record, that. that was not my intent. My intent was the two and ten and bowl eligibility. That's That's <laughs> the part I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, you can edit that part out, that oh. eight win part, Brian, okay? okay? Yeah, I, I said that last year, too, is like we had some people start talking about a bowl game. I'm like, hey, pump the brakes here. We, this is the <laughs> process. So. Yeah. We, will, we, we will follow that up uh, next year, and, and, and hopefully we'll be talking about a great season there in Lawrence. But, uh, Lance, we really appreciate the time, and, and thank you so much for joining us here on the Head Coach U Podcast. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. All right, for Lance Leipold and Bronco Mendenhall, I'm Brian Fisher. Thank you so much for tuning in for another episode of Head Coach U, and we'll catch you again next time.